All right. Good evening. My name is Tony Brewer, and along with Joan Hawkins and Kyle Kloss, I'm a co-producer of this, the Writers Guild Spoken Word Series, virtual edition. We've been virtual um, since, wow, it's been just over a year now. We started, um, we started doing this virtually in May of 2020. Before that, we had been uh, in the back room at Bear's Place, and we hope to get back there again. This is our fifth year of uh, holding this series, the Spoken Word series, and uh, we look forward to when we can be together in person. But for the time being, we're going to continue uh, virtually. We are sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. The Writers Guild at Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I had a couple of uh, event type things that I wanted to let you know about. Third Sunday Right is a uh, currently is a virtual place where you can find writing prompts and the company of other writers. Members visit the private Facebook page uh, to respond to prompts that are posted monthly. You can write and post any time during the month and offer, offer a response to others' writing by sharing a readback line, a line from their piece, in the comments. For more information or to join the group, contact Shauna Ritter at shauna747 at gmail dot uh, excuse me, at gmail.com. Please include Third Sunday in your subject line. A couple of events coming up. Our virtual Writers Guild picnic, our annual picnic, is uh, going to be via Zoom this year, Sunday, July 25th at 1 p.m. It'll be more like an open mic than a picnic, but uh, more details on our website. Again, that's uh, Sunday, July 25th at 1 p.m. Also, First Sunday Pros is coming Yay. back. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, just, who's, oh. I'm just making happy, happy yep. dancing. <laughs> Joan is happy to be hosting First Sunday Pros again, uh, live and in person, Sunday, August 1st, from 3 to 5 p.m. in the Monroe County Public Library, room 2A. More info to come on our website. And lastly, our next uh, monthly uh, Writers Guild business meeting is Saturday, August 28th. That will be a virtual meeting at 3 p.m. on Zoom, and you can contact us for the link. All of this info is available on our website, which is Writers Guild Bloomington, all one word, writersguildbloomington.com. Or you can like or follow us or mash that old subscribe button on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We've also got a spiffy uh, YouTube channel where all of this delicious content is going to go once we get it from Facebook. Um, we also uh, strongly recommend you sign up for our newsletter by visiting our website. Joan does a fantastic job of uh, putting out information not only about what the Guild is doing, but what other writers in the region are doing and other writing groups as well and opportunities to submit work and things of that nature. And one so, correction, the, sure. um, the business meeting on August 28th, that will also be in Monroe County Public Library room 2A. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. This has just been handed to me. <laughs> the, yeah, the, uh, wow, that's great news. So our, yeah, our regular business meeting will actually be in person in August. Yeah. It'll be fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so everybody can come again. Yeah. Uh, we also we, uh, invite you already to come back uh, Wednesday, August 4th for the next edition of this spoken word series featuring poets Hiromi Yoshida, Jay Alcato, Tonya Matthew with music by sax player Tony Malaby. That should be another hot one. Um, so that's enough for me. Let's get to our features this evening. We have three fantastic poets, Sierra Miller, uh, Lisa Kwong and Michael Bauman, who will be joining us shortly. First up, we want to have a little bit of music from our guest artist Kiko Pavlok Pavolka. Excuse me, Kiko Pavolka uh, is a New York-based musician, composer, and educator 
<clears throat> excuse me, whose strikingly original music blends pop and jazz with the music and sensibilities of her native Japan. Akiko was born in Tokyo and grew up in Yokohama. She graduated in 1994 with a degree in performance from Boston's prestigious Berklee College of Music and was also awarded the Cleo Lane Outstanding Vocalist Award. She moved to New York City in 95 and formed her band House of Illusion shortly thereafter. She has been performing her music regularly in New York ever since. And in addition, she has toured extensively in Portugal, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Argentina, and her native Japan. She has released six recordings of her own music, the most recent of which is Late Parade. Please welcome Kiko Pavoka. Hi, everybody. I would like to start with two of my original songs. Uh, the first one is called Malala and followed by Wave Wave Goodbye.
That was wonderful. Thank you, Kiko. It was wonderful. We'll be hearing uh, more from her a little bit later. First, I would like to bring up uh, bring up our first feature for this evening, uh, Michael Bauman. <clears throat> excuse me. Michael is assistant professor of communication and speech. Uh, excuse me, assistant professor of communication and speech and debate coach at Marion University in Indianapolis, a city where he has headlined at more than twenty performance poetry venues and taught workshops to poets of every age. Other than saying it to people, he's never published a poem, which is his 2021 aim. Michael is also gifted at piano and can bench press more than double his body weight. Michael Bauman. Can everybody hear me? Cool. Okay. Um, sweet. Yeah, I'll just jump right into it. Um, lately, I've been writing to answer questions like who am I and why do I exist and so therefore I've been writing a lot about outer space and um the title of the first poem is universe and uh yeah it really delighted me when I finally figured out um I'll drop it into the chat how to put like the backslash in the middle because for me that really highlighted the words origins so like uni means one um, or whole, and then verse means to turn. So like universe means turning into one thing or one whole thing turning. Um, so there's like this wonderful pun also, I feel like with verse, because like poetry of course is written in verse um, lines rather than, you know, paragraphs. So anyway, here, here's the poem, it's called, it's called Universe. In the beginning, there was no word. There was no world, there was no, light there was no thing there was nothing there was only listening there was only receiving the universe forever unfolding into the outer space surrounding it forever expanding into itself faster and faster as it goes trying to find a vocabulary a boundary any boundary anything like a boundary i am also trying to find out how much space i take up in this world I am also trying forever expanding into my outer self, wondering forever, wondering if ever I'll find a vocabulary or an orbit, any orbit, anything like an orbit. I am also twirling, twerking, tilting, whirling, twisting, traipsing, tristing through space faster and faster as I go. I don't know what in the I am doing ducking, dodging, microwaves, gamma rays, infrared, x-rays, ultraviolet, ultraviolet rays, not to mention meteors, not to mention metaphors, not to mention closet doors, not to mention comets, asteroids, space debris, space flash, space trash, satellite crash, leftovers from flyovers and supernova star startovers, solar flares, constellations of little bears in the steep stairs to heaven or to hell. I can't tell it's disorienting out here with no atmosphere. Not to mention deadly, not to mention dead lonely, not to mention dead cold, not to mention the tension of apprehension, the feeling of constant suspension. Every time I try to answer the question, why do I exist? I write a poem about the solar system. So here it goes. In the beginning, there was word, there was world, there was light, there was poem, there was poetry, there was only listening, receiving the universe, being in the universe, being a being, being a boy, being, unfolding, expanding, wondering, what do I risk when I speed up? What do I risk losing when I slow down? So that's poem number one. Um, and I think that this whole evening, I'm going to continue with the space theme. Um, thank you for all the comments that went through. I will catch up on them in a moment, um, but I'm going to move on to the poem Space. Um, space. Boy, did that bad boy, the Big Bang, Big Blast, some dead-ass, bad-ass, noble gas, supernova solar sass into our abstracts. <laughs> billowing, bellowing, belly laugh, bursts of burning bodies, big 
belched batches of brimstone byproduct bunching bouquets of budding binary stars molten molting baby bird blossoms firework fledglings flowers showered forward toward beyond breaking beyond baking burned into being just like bread being broken open for the first time to breathe out into galaxy raised blazed brazed though it may be we are the bread obviously bruised though we may be and considering that we needed to be needed before being baked into you into me you and me oh the big old bang a big old hug a big thank you and at least one honorary degree in astronomy or sociology or anthropology but y'all yo we all also owe the big old bang an apology <clears throat> because after it built boiling, broiling, bromine, brokelium, bismuth, beryllium, barium, borium, boron, and all the other boring basic bitch elementary shit that begins with B and all the other chemistry kit elements that range from A to Z, we, you and me, jumbled all of our alphabet soup up. Back up. Listen up. When we language, when we holler hammered hydrogen and helium into hieroglyphics, carve carbon into communications and spun sparks into speech infected plutonium with politics and radioactive half-life rhetoric and twisted tungsten into tongues into sin, radon into racism, silicon, sexism, misogynistic wordsmith, alchemy, we, Benjamin Button backflipped backwards into black holes bending, bizarrely distorted, dis Disrupted, disrupting, corrupted, corrupting, corroding, oxidizing, spiraling out of control, out of shape, greedily, desperately gasping, grasping for anything that will make us feel whole. Swallow, swell, light, matter, sound, nothing. To listen is to receive the universe. To listen is to heal. To start stacking yourself into the stellar storyteller that you are. To start singing constellations into shapes, sketching star statues. To listen is to unbecome the black hole. Jettison your Benjamin Button self back to beryllium, back to barium, back to before the Big Bang, but better. Cool, so those are uh, the first two poems that I'll open with. And uh, thank you all so much for listening. I'm really excited to be here and just so here for all of, of the art. So yeah, I can't wait for uh, someone else to take the mic, so to speak. <laughs> thank you again. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Next, I want to welcome <clears throat> Sierra Miller. A native of Chicago, Sierra holds both an MFA and an MA in poetry and African-American African Diaspora Studies from Indiana University. She has published poems and academic essays in such collections and periodicals as The Whiskey of Our Discontent, The Breakbeat Poets, Mosaic, Fjord's Review, African American Review, Callaloo, Muzzle, Alice Walker, Critical Insights, Chorus, and many more. She currently teaches Afro-American Studies at Kennedy King College, and she is the founder of Miller's Learning Center, a test prep and career support company with an international reach. Please welcome Sierra Miller. Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? All right, and great job, Michael. Uh, what a way, what a way to start off the poetry section. And the music was wonderful too. Um, please don't hate me, you all, but I'm thinking, I, I wanna stick with newer works. And so each of my sections, it may only be one piece each, because they're relatively long. I wanna start with a prose uh, piece and it's called The Weight Problem. All right, here we go. My issue with the wording of the weight problem is that the problem never seemed to be mine. After all, I'm the one who is fat and jolly. I'm the one who ordered Richard's premium ice cream three days in a row after a breakup as a cliche form of healing. I didn't regret discovering banana pudding, peach cobbler, and sweet potato pie ice cream. My God, the magic that business works in their ice cream making will make you wonder why those desserts were never ice cream in the first place. But a problem is something one would perhaps struggle a bit to solve. It can't be easy, and it has to be something to figure out. 
So the weight problem does not quite seem fitting because I wasn't trying to solve how to be 50 pounds smaller when I bought the ice cream three days in a row. In fact, the ice cream was the solution. In fact, the noodles, the fried rice with coconut shrimp and crab meat, the pounds of a seafood boil with special Cajun sauce, the also scrumptious waffles from Chicago waffles that has the mix of red velvet, pistachio, strawberry, cheesecake, and chocolate flavors was never a problem. At least not one that I believed would cause immediate concerns besides additional cavities in my mouth. Uh, these were all situations that I willfully entered, aware of the consequences and determined to not solve the problem of overeating or eating too much of what I damn well please. However, after meditation, I've come to learn why I eat the way I do, which by the way, I don't think is too excessive. When I was younger, my biggest whoopings were a result of eating my mom's sweets. She would hide her Oreos and pops on the highest level of the cupboard or beneath her bed, and whenever she stepped away from the apartment, she would state very firmly that she did not want me or my sister to eat any of her snacks because that was her stash. Some children get beat for stealing lump sums of money or telling gargantuan lies that could potentially lead to a life of imprisonment. But there I was, beaten for eating food, my sweet tooth and I guilty. What I learned from being beaten for drinking the seven up pops and slurping down several popsicles is that I came to see junk food as prized food. I came to see it as what I deserved. Today, after a long day of work, teaching three college classes and tutoring three students individually without as much as a 30 minute break in between, I immediately go to the Uber Eats app and negotiate gaining extra weight and chewing on the most delicious steak taco from Jimmy's Famous Burgers. The decision is always clear. I will choose the latter because I deserve the beef, the grease, the taste of the cornmeal shell, I perhaps have a few more good years left in me before that one taco causes me diabetes or heart disease. Although one day I stood before a mirror to do the bunny hop, that dance Chicago millennials may know when you bend down, twist the leg in, go down again and twist the other leg in. And oh, the heaving I did just to come back up and the way my legs stubbornly refused to turn inward. Perhaps that was an accumulation of eating whatever the hell I wanted. So sure, in that instance, I had a problem but it still was not a weight problem. It was the problem of not getting my body to move the way I wanted it to or look the way it used to. I have tried lemonade diets, cleanses, excessive workouts, and what I've learned is that one, people are starving themselves and calling it divine. And two, none of these things are sustainable for a girl who grew up where candy was the biggest treat she could offer herself. What I've learned is that talking about fitness in, the, in a country that supersizes meals is ridiculous. Selling salads at places like McDonald's and Chick-fil-A is a capitalistic ploy to maintain our dollars. And some of us are foolhardy enough to continue investing in their lettuce. There is no weight problem in a country like America. Sorry, like, <clears throat> sorry, in a country like America, because America willfully creates this issue for its citizens and somehow expects us to be some super slim supermodels. Yet, I'm not content enough to blankly blame America for what may or may not be a national weight problem. I need names and numbers. I hate when we turn our anger into abstractions. I can call out several culprits such as myself and my Facebook postings of a happier me during weight loss journeys. However, the discipline required to be that slim in a country surrounded by processed foods and sweets requires downright deprivation. Most of our juices are steeped in sugars to a point where we think we know how papaya tastes, not realizing that papaya often tastes like feet. All of this is to say that I'm not injudicious enough to believe that because a doctor says I'm without ailments, that I'm healthy. If I can't bunny hop or walk up and down some stairs without losing breath, then I may have a problem. But it is to say that my weight was always a risk that I was willing to take. So when you talk about a problem, go deeper. The problem is that I think I deserve bad food. The problem is that I value bad food. As an adult, I will eat all the candy, popsicles, potato chips, and cookies because I am no longer poor. I will share these items with friends too, weigh the risk of these foods killing them and choose to offer it as love because this is how I prevail against a childhood of indigence. Each order of food is a reminder of how far I have come. 
such a far cry from my friend Jeremy buying me fudge rounds and star crunches to quell my stomach growls during seventh period English. I spent many of my earlier years relatively slim. I was teased for appearing anorexic slim. I looked back at those days with a fantasy of my potential size, often forgetting that I was hungry during those days. I don't need your outside eyes telling me to control my weight in a country that is out of control with profiting off my desires. I did buy a juicer though, and I do enjoy the natural sweetness of a lime versus lime candy and natural orange juice over water sugar and orange flavor. Yet weight is an area that I have not quite mastered. Just like I have not quite mastered being comfortable with obesity, despite knowing the faultiness of BMI standards. I wish I could say that I remain steadfast amongst disapproving eyes. Instead, I go home, do side-by-side -side glances of my figure in the mirror, and try to figure out how to calm this childhood trauma and be picturesque in the eyes of people who still believe my weight is the problem. And that's that piece. All right, and I, unfortunately, I think that I want that to conclude my section here. I might add two to the next one, but I'll conclude this section with that one. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Sierra. And I too am glad I had something to eat before um, before we started this evening. Thank you, that was wonderful. Let's bring up now our third feature for this evening. I can get to my notes. Lisa Kwong, uh, a native of Radford, Virginia. Lisa Kwong is author of the chapbook Becoming Appalachian, forthcoming from Glass Liar Press. Her poems have appeared in Pine Mountain, Sand and Gravel, A Literary Field Guide to Southern Appalachia, Anthology of Appalachian Writers, Best New Poets 2014, Still the Journal, Pluck, and other publications. Her poem Searching for Wanton Soup excuse me, Searching for Wonton Soup, is the winner of Sundress Publications' 2019 Poetry Broadside Contest. She currently teaches Asian American Studies at Indiana University and English at Ivy Tech Community College in Bloomington, Indiana. Please welcome Lisa Kwong. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Writers Guild, for having me. Um, it's great to be back. I think the last reading I did for Writers Guild was actually the rehearsal for my keynote back in 2019. 2019. Um, so it's good to be back. Um, so I see this reading as a celebration of a lot of things. Um, it is the first reading I've done since my chapbook got accepted, so yay. Um, I'm also celebrating 10 years of living in Bloomington and 10 years of friendship with Sierra. IUMFA represent. Um, and this is also my birthday month. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, um, maybe after recording, but um, I feel like reading these first two poems hits differently uh, because it is my birthday month. So the first poem is on the 42nd anniversary of my father's swim from China, October 17th, 2015. Suspended between shores, you watch your friend's tire disappear beneath bluish black waters, never to resurface. When you agreed to swim together, you promised to keep going, even if some could not go on. Someone must reach the shore of freedom. This journey must not be in vain. You keep swimming, your family's voices echoing from the home you left your son and daughter's faces etched on clouds. Your limbs grow heavier after the first hour. You keep time by the shifting sky, one arm, one leg moving after the other, strong strokes slicing cold Taipang Bay. Salt slides from your eyelashes. The sun is a blinking siren. Spotting a shark fin in the distance, you quiet your strokes, your eyes still on Hong Kong. Even the fear of being eaten alive can't stop you. You want to live to see your babies grow up, to grow old with your wife. You must succeed as a man, as the head of your family. You keep swimming, believe your blood father is watching, the father you never knew. You must keep swimming to rewrite history. His early death will not be yours. You will live even though your legs feel like sacks of rice. 
You believe there is something stronger than exhaustion. This is why you continue to kick towards freedom. This is why you won't stop until your feet touch shallow ground again. This is love spinning generations of blood, red legacies that will survive shark bites, the ghosts of family secrets. You must keep swimming to reach the shore where you will be reborn, a tiger emerging. So um, I think every, every poem has its time. So this second poem uh, is not necessarily a sequel, it's a companion poem. Um, to the first poem. And I can't believe it took me you know, five years to think, okay, I need to write my mom's side of the story, right? Um, and I finally did, and I'm glad I did um, because her side of the story deserves to be told too. So this is a poem for my mother who dared be on Taishan. You dared to elope after your mother shook her fist at your husband, who would journey his way out of poverty, out of Taishan. When you received his letter of how he swam in cold, shark-filled Taipang Bay for three hours, you lit incense in gratitude for a safe arrival in Hong Kong, not daring to imagine the what-ifs. Remember the morning when you found his side of the bed empty, a snake of fear slithering in your heart. You exhaled as your babies slept a few feet away. You lit incense then as prayers for him, yourself, your two-year-old son, your two-month baby girl, not knowing when you would see him again. You hold on to hope as your babies grow strong with the love of great grandma, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and neighbors. They babysit while you raise chickens and hogs to sell. When you bike on countryside paths to go to city markets, your son, and daughter, your son and daughter ride along, boisterous about what is beyond your village. Before putting the envelopes in the mail, you read your son's letters, carefully penned characters on thin red and blue lined paper. Baba, wai ho, wai hyong go, go ging mama, moi moi, wai kane, dear daddy, we are well. I am good and taking care of mama and little sister. We miss you. Every day your daughter asks, a baba all night? And you tell her first, Hong Kong, then America. You hear about her captivating neighbors and classmates with their sticky tooth talk. Hear about how she shielded her big brother from bullies when they mock his bulbous head a fearlessness she inherited from her father. A child born to parents so poor that no villager wanted to hold him as a baby, your son soon earns respect when others see how he zooms through advanced math on the blackboard, chalk dust flying everywhere. You are so proud and hope your son succeeds in life despite you and your husband having only six years of schooling. As old as siblings, you help support your large families. One day, it is time to leave Taishan, your parents, younger brothers and sisters, friends. You don't know when you will return. This might be the last time you see your family. Everyone speaks only beautiful travel wishes and presses red envelopes into your hands. Even if you want to cry, don't. You are going to America, the place, they call Gold, the place they call Gold Mountain, where your husband is. You must survive the plane ride first. Now nine years old, your son, your son bounces in his seat while you and your daughter vomit into little white paper bags, flight turbulence too much to stomach as you grieve a little for the home you've left. But you forget this discomfort when you see your husband for the first time in seven years. Your daughter, only two months when he left, loosens from your hand, runs and shouts, Baba, Daddy, you never carried me on your back. He laughs, hugging your daughter and son close. We'll recall later how he worried before escaping. This might be the last time I see you all. You and your husband vow to never be apart again for so long 
even though your love has endured across countries and continents. You both vow to give your children everything, a world they won't have to escape, a home where there will always be enough to eat. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Glad to have you back. Virtually at any rate. Thanks for being here. And it's uh, it's been great to uh, sort of reunite Lisa and Sierra, who, as Lisa noted, has, they've been friends for a long time. So it's good to kind of see you both together. I mean, I can see you. You're next to each other on screen here. So. So it's good. Yeah, it's good to see you both. Let us now uh, have some more music from our uh, guest artist this evening, uh, Kiko Pavolka. Now, um, Kiko had some uh, translations of a couple of songs. You let me know uh, when you're going to play those and I'll put those in the chat. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Technical problem. <laughs> okay. So, um, I am going to perform three songs, and uh, these are relatively all new songs. And then I actually uh, sent Tony uh, the translation version of these two songs. Uh, uh, because I'm going to sing in Japanese, my mother language. Uh, the first song is called the Sunset Park Bus Rider. Uh, I'm sorry, Sunset Park Bus Ride. And this one, I didn't send it to Tony anything. So just please bear with me. This, <laughs> okay. And then the next two song uh, is going to be Sand of memory and the third one is called please spare my life okay those are uh, uh, there are um, English translation uh, it would be great if actually Tony can read it for everybody is that possible would you like me to, sorry, I'll we'll turn my video on here too. Would you like me to read it before you perform yeah. or after? Okay. Before. But first okay. song, let me just sing first. Okay, you don't have to. Sure, sing. yeah. There's no translation. And then after this song, can you uh, read uh, the translation of Sound of Memory? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sure will, thank you.
is the Sunset Park bus ride. And next song is going to be called uh, Sa Sand of Memory. Tony, could you read the, his translation, please? Yes. Sand of Memory. A seagull standing far, silently, in the afternoon light, its hesitant shadow. A distant time, I scoop it up, sand of memory, careful not to spill, now. By the shore, the winds dancing, melting into the light, as if it can fly away again. with the sand of memory. That was the sand of memory. 
Thank you. <laughs> and uh, next song, which is the last song of this segment, set, uh, it's called Please Spare My Life. Tony, could you read the translation, please? Yes. <clears throat> Please spare my life. Footsteps, like heartbeats, just ascertain the rhythm. Don't let it go. The asphalt of the sidewalks continues to your room. A blue-black sunny sky smiles with the face of an honest man, without hesitation, as if you are no longer here. From far away, the boat finally arrives. There is nobody on board anymore. Only you are drifting on the waves. Can they still lead you?
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kiko Pavoka, thank you. That was just, that was wonderful. And thanks so much for uh, asking me to uh, read the translations. It was really nice. Wow. Let's, uh, let's return to our poets now. They're going to come at you in a slightly different order. Get the order up here. I believe first up is Sierra, Sierra Miller. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, once again, I'm coming with something that's kind of essayish. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I saw some of the comments. Thank you guys so much for your words. I will say that this piece is also kind of confessional. I've really been playing around with uh, vulnerability in my writing. And I may say some things that seem a little offensive. This is not the Bible or anything like that. Let's just say that this was written during a time where I was just pissed. <laughs> and so I'm pretty much coming for the poetry scene, okay? <laughs> so just watch out for that. And I also wanna say, um, I was immersed in the poetry scene at the age of 14 um, in the Chicago Poetry Slam scene. And, you know, as a grown person now, I reflect on how that experience gave me confidence with my voice, but I also see the ways in which it can be misleading when you give a teenager that type of platform and that teenager goes out into the world thinking that the world will really, really value um, their words. And that's not quite how things work out. So here we go. It's called Holy Ghost. I graduated from an MFA program in 2015 and published one chapbook, Silver Bullet, in 2016 on a small press that is now defunct. It is 2021 and I cannot say that I have published a new poem in nearly five years. I have drafted poems that I have barely revisited. I created the Bloomington, Indiana Poetry uh, Slam, which is an ongoing phenomenon. Yet I have not felt compelled to attend a single open mic or poetry slam since returning to Chicago in 2015. Selfishly, I desire an audience for some of my own readings that I'm luckily able to book considering my history of being immersed in the poetry scene as a teenager, but I have felt no holy ghost attending poetry slams, open mics, or even those supposedly sophisticated readings. No long pause, imagined enjambment, sonnet, or other poetry device has allowed my bills to become paid. I snarl at the urgency poets speak with in terms of necessitating writing without first asking if I ate, if they can contribute at least 1,500 to my monthly rent or lean into me compassionately to hear how it feels to live on the edge of grief daily with a gnawing thought that my mother might pass away any day and I may have to create a GoFundMe page despite being the great black hope of my family. I grew tired of the hypocrisy of struggling poets still dancing with hope that their words are the Bible, yet there is no Holy Ghost when I attend their readings. I utter aloud mm, more from YouTube tarot card readings for Torians or girl chats with my neighbors. What makes us poets think that our words are so much more special than those of the man who hides his nose behind his newspaper and barely speaks? The poetry scene that somehow gave me a voice as a teenager became the same scene that lied to me about the power of my voice, similar to college when I received A pluses on argumentative essays, failing to realize that in day-to-day -day conversations, a strong thesis and supporting evidence weighs less than a person's ego. I had no desire to hop on train after bus after train to hear poets whose words did not inspire me after working grueling hours to pay rent and no one would offer me at least $1,500, not even the full price of my rent, because damn it, they could probably barely afford their own rent. After taking some time away from the poetry scene, I returned to it with a new lens. I initially turned to poetry because I felt like a social outcast, but today I feel more normal in the sense that I work and I pay bills. Must I write before I die? And if I die before I write, maybe I could not quite write my own legacy. I spent five years not writing a damn thing. And what I learned is that I don't need poetry to live. I'm still alive. And maybe for five long years, I had nothing worth saying, nothing worth pumping up my ego further to spill out on the stage or page for more likes. Maybe I needed to share all of my insight with myself. Oh, how we sip our water between our readings and think our words matter. To who though? 
I am a poet who believes that we no longer live in an age where people take the time to hear one another. I once wrote on my Facebook page that being a poet was one of the hardest jobs in the world. And a former teacher deleted me for that statement, not understanding the depth of my thought. I think writing a poem is as complex as surgery. Taking the pen or scalpel to save a life, namely your own, requires technique, mastery. This is not to say that I have ever succeeded in the endeavor. Perhaps what I imagine a poem having the potential to do has not been achieved by any poet yet. I did not publish a new poem in five years, despite knowing I was a writer since second grade. Despite my first job being a, uh, sorry, first job of uh, being a creative writer at Gallery 37 in downtown Chicago, despite achieving my MFA. And what I know is that when people ask about your writing, they seldom ask about your well being which makes me wonder if they ever gave a damn about you in the first place, or if they were simply acknowledging that you're not producing something you used to produce. My poems didn't save me from homelessness. It was me, the living, breathing poem of the spiritual forces that be that kept me from holding a sign for money while sitting on downtown concrete. My poems never paid the askers bills either. When I tell them that I have assisted nearly 500 students with getting into their top middle school, high school, or college, and that I'm editing the dissertations of so many people who are winning awards, do they even show that they care? I'm Rihanna out here, in line to become the next Black woman billionaire through my talents outside of the music poetry industry, but all you care about is my next album. I want to make it known here and make it very clear. It is a privilege to carve out time to write. As a woman who has had to work 17 of the 24 hours within a day, don't ask me how my writing is coming along. That is capitalist patriarchy. You know I'm a Black woman who has seldom been handed an olive branch. I've had to create opportunities for myself tooth and nail each time. As an entrepreneur, I care less about the facade of doing well in our society. I struggled. I struggled immensely. And if that brings you any bit of joy to hear upon reading, you, nor your poetry, if you even write poetry, are really radical. You are the reason why I stopped trying to make time to show up to poetry events. If I learn anything else from my writing hiatus, it is that MFA programs are largely in place to make you forget your magic. Have you ever opened a book and wondered what made that person brave enough to write that book? Maybe you opened the book and read some of your own ideas that were shut down in a workshop a year prior. We claim to know so much about cliches that our originality wavers on nonsense. How can I catch the Holy Ghost if the language does not resonate? Guess what happens when you stop looking towards something or someone else to validate you? You stop giving a fuck. You shred the template of life. You start to live your truth. Thank you. <laughs> and actually, I think, yeah, just one. I think that was long. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Sierra. You need a mic so that you can drop it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's really wonderful. Um, I always appreciate the perspectives of writers in the trenches, writers who have made it. Um, yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for that. Next, let's bring back her good friend, Lisa Kwong. Yeah, I definitely feel that, Sierra. I mean, last year I taught a total of, like, I don't know. I just know, well, fall 2021 alone, I taught two classes, full classes at IU, and then I taught five classes at Ivy Tech. So it's like, when do I have time to write, right? Um, but this spring, I recommitted myself to to my writing because I'm like I keep on giving to everyone else um and I've been sitting on this manuscript for like at least two to three years so I I busted it out I made myself bust it out so um yeah I definitely felt a lot of what you were saying Sierra because like writing careers don't just look one way right everybody has their own trajectory their own path and I mean, there are probably people jealous of me. I don't know. But um, I've just, you know, I just try to be very strategic about, you know, when I write, where I submit, because like, I just really don't have the time to do a lot of, you know, other things that other writers do. So 
Okay, that's my little soapbox. Um, so I'm gonna do a mix of old and new-ish. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually gonna start out a little more lighthearted and might get a little more serious um, in the second set. So first up, uh, portrait of Appalachian Chinese girls and their grandmother's garden. Navigating Ningying's maze of winter melon and zucchini, my little sister and I simmered under the late summer sun, where men zoom by and pick up trucks, hollering Chinese girls like they were hurling butter knives at our heads. Ningying's neighbors, college boys, like to bake themselves on their roof. We hated college boys. A swarm of them worked at dad's restaurant, always reeking of sock sweat and bourbon and Coke. They'd loll around while we ate Chinese sausage rice, pointing at us, their laughter, a chorus of snot trumpets. Inside the metal crisscross fence, we meandered as two boys eyed us from their shingled perch. Standing up, they yanked down their trunks, butts facing us, yelled, nah, and out came their tongues. The gourds I was lugging dropped from my arms onto concrete. Sis, don't look. Only four, my little sister stared. She wonders now, I wondered what was hanging between their legs. I remember the butts. Okay. Um, all right, I think Sierra has given me some courage to read new shit. So I just cursed online, okay, um, <laughs> it's all right. Um, so speaking of cursing, uh, this is called, um, and just, I guess, to be clear, um, Ying Ying is paternal grandmother and Ye Ye is paternal grandfather. Uh, so speaking of cursing, this is learning how to curse and twice in these. At Ying Ying and Ye Ye's house, strangers would call offering this or that. A child, I was told not to speak to strangers. So I'd hand over the rotary phone to Yaya. Yuga must have startled the voice on the other end. But me and my younger siblings giggled at the booming and bellowing of Yaya's syllables, like inflating giant balloons with ominous eyes and creepy faces that hover over parade floats. Not knowing he was saying the worst Toysonese curse ever, the equivalent the equivalent of mf -er. Later at family dinners, sometimes daddy used it too when shouting at Yaya, -ya, not his blood father, but the father who raised him from age two. The distance between them, while vast, was not as far as the universe between daddy and real Yaya. -ya. Now, when I'm about to pop off, cursing and twice the knees calms my inherited temper. Cursing in English only makes me feel worse as if I've bitten off Lego heads. Okay, and I'm gonna think, we'll see if I have time to do two, but definitely gonna do this one. Um, so this is also, an, I guess, newer piece that I haven't read very often, or if I have, it was a long time ago. Um, and it, it does, there are some food descriptions, so hopefully nobody's getting too hungry. Um, this is called Bitten by Bitterness. And it's in four sections, so I'll do the one, two, and all that. Okay, one. Carrying an amber cup, Nini marched towards me and I started running. It contained ginseng soup, a flavor to advance for my immature taste buds. My little feet pounded on the living room carpet to the scratchy porch floor. There was nowhere to hide. Cornered on the row of worn surplus restaurant chairs, she forced the cup to my lips. Drink, drink, ginseng soup is good for you, too. Once, Ningying gave me a bowl of ginseng kanji for an afternoon snack. At least it had rice and shredded chicken. But this half bitter taste still frightened me as I stared at the round white bowl with a pinkish rim. I took that bowl of doom, snuck into the main bathroom, closed the door, then dumped it all in the trash. I snuck back out, held out the bowl. I finished it. 
Nini smiled, her gold and silver teeth shining, until sister told her the truth. Nini never gave me ginseng again. Three. I don't fear bitterness anymore. Every time I return home, my parents prepare a gigantic bowl of bitter melon soup. The pieces float in clear broth, little grain alligator backs surrounded by sliced pork. This soup doesn't bite, it heals. I've read that bitter melon lowers blood sugar. In Taishan, my aunts, mom's younger sisters served us bitter melon daily, stir fried with spare rib tips or pork belly and black bean sauce. Four, I fear the rising levels of sweetness in my body. Bitter melon isn't ubiquitous like rarely dressed desserts at crowd grocery counters and tempt from glass cases at bakeries. What is bitter stuns my mouth, chases toxins away. What is sweet may kill me. One day I may wake up a pile of sugar. And I think I do have time to read just this short one. It should be less than that. So I will end with Childhood Fade and Litany. Behind the crisscross fence, I thought home was a safe place. The door's lock loosened. I questioned home as a safe place. Nien took insulin shots and I looked away. Nien had a stroke. Home was no longer a safe place. Main Street emptied of traffic and home was a safe place. Smash beer bottles kept littering the driveway. Desperate men played lottery at Pack and Sack. I watched her bones become landscape. Nini had another stroke. Home was not a safe place. Girls cried at the strangeness of incense. Smoke tendrils crawled down our throats. My sister and I secretly went to the graveyard. I questioned God. I asked why home was not a safe place. Lightning squeezed my hand and home became a safe place again. I cried at Nini's tomb and I used to think home was a safe place. My grief grew a noose. I touched the letters on the tombstone. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I'm really thrilled that uh, people are reading new shit tonight. That's always uh, it. Always takes um, you're taking a chance, and uh, and I definitely appreciate that. I know that I don't read new stuff everywhere, um, but there are places I really like to read new shit. So. I don't like reading new shit here. Uh, let's bring up our uh, final reader in this uh, in this set, Michael Bauman. All right. Um, well, to keep the train running, I don't know if that's the metaphor I really want to use, but I've also got some new shit. Um, I wanted quickly, though, to say I really resonated with one of the comments in the chat just that, you know, Lisa and Sierra and Akiko, all of your work, it just is this great striking combination of the confessional and the political and the very personal and expressive. And it's just been such a cool night so far. So this is really cool to be a part of the set with y'all. Um, yeah, so this new shit that I'm about to read is inspired by Margaret Atwood. She's one of my favorite writers. Um, this book, The Penelope Ad, is excellent. Um, it's like a feminist revisionist retelling of history um, of the of the story of the Odyssey told from his wife's Penelope's perspective. And um, she's such a cool lady and the book kind of explores her character in really, really cool ways. Um, another character in Greek mythology, Io, uh, was one of the mistresses that the god Jupiter had. Um, so this is a poem about Io um, and here's how it starts. Did you know that Io is a moon? But not our moon, 
Our moon controls the tide. Push, pull, push, pull, push. But Io is pulled, pulled, pulled this way by giant gravity of giant Jupiter and this way by his many maiden moons. And the push, pull, push, pull, push, pull heats her up from the inside out like when one works clay until it's warm. It's warpable and wonderful. So no wonder that Io has over 400 volcanoes all over her celestial body. And that is how I feel. <laughs> all of the time, pushed and pulled and pulled and pulled apart and smashed together again and again. Did you know that Io was once someone's daughter? Radiant river daughter of a river god father and her river mother was the daughter of an ocean god father. So Io is as fluid as a body of water and she unlucky daughter got in some hot, hot water when Zeus caught her and taught her what big bulls do when they get hot to trot, to trot, to trot, trot, trot. Did you know that Io was his wife's high priestess? that he fell in love with her and don't get it twisted. She didn't know what she was getting into when she got into Jupiter's orbit. And now she's just spinning, spinning, spinning. And to call his wife off the who, what, when, where, why, how he transformed Io into a white cow. But somehow his Hera heard word that his Trojan horse heifer had a home wrecking hoe hiding inside its filthy white hide. So she asked to keep the cow pretty, pretty pet for her garden. But really she kept the cow pretty, pretty prisoner, guarded, grounded, graceful as gadfly gagged a prisoner of marital war but did you know that io escaped or she thought she had running 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 pulling 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 across napoli across the ionian sea rapidly mad cow desperately and she refugee eventually galloped her hooves through the galaxy where gravity pulled 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 her back and then apart and then apart and then apart caught in the chorus of her sibling rivalry sister wife moons did you know that io is a moon which means that it reflects light but it doesn't produce any did you know that I am, I O, damned to go around and around in circles and cycles, bottle it up, bottle it up, bottle it up, but then the belly falls out of Orion and you're pulled back into orbit again. Whew, so that poem is very new, um, and this one is only slightly new. It's called Outer Space Journey. <laughs> Afterwards, after it happens, gather yourself back together again like nebula clouds. Collect the chorus of your harmonious self, the concert of your body back into melody, back into one. Gather all of the little littered battered shells, the little heavens and little hells and little driftwood pieces of yourself that you found all around, bullied by ebb and by flow, by gravity, loneliness, and time. And two, take your time while you fold them all into your solar system shawl, a cosmic basket of comets. You sling your shawl over your shoulder, then put on your celestial accessories, tighten the Titan jarm bracelet with planets and dwarf stars and calypsos and calliopes, slide Saturn onto your ring finger, tighten your asteroid belt three, step out into the cosmos, trek the breadcrumb trail of braille stars until you finally find me way out by the quasars, pulsing, 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 pooling on a cardigan because it's cold out here after so many light years. Come on inside. <laughs> you can step under the yawning awning of my mouth. I will let you climb deep down into the warm, into my beating, into my core. So open the door to my left atrium, wipe your shoes on the mat, step into my heart, into its kitchen. I taped a note to the fridge. <laughs> my mother is a mountain and my father is a forest, the note says. My father is a forest of trees, tall all around me, shelter, lumber, meditation. My mountain mother has grown flowers and avalanches, and one of those is me, but I don't know which one yet. Pocket the note. Reach inside the bag of bones that is your body. Reach for the chandelier of keys hanging upside down, dangling, colliding, and jangling inside of you. Select the one that I gave to you and lock the door behind you. Swallow the key once more. 
four. When we die, we will cave in like supernovas, five. I put myself into bad situations. Sometimes I do it on purpose and by accident. I like to create chaos and then order from it. Forgiveness is difficult. It begins with yourself. Dismantle your machinery, open up the music box of your biology, your biography, lay all of the parts out, clean them with a soft towel, oil the cogs, and then rebuild. Cool, so that'll do it for this section for me. Thank you again for listening. Fantastic, thank you, Michael. So what we're gonna do now is our three poets are gonna come right back at you with a lightning round and they're each gonna do one poem and um, I'm just going to give you the order and then you can all crack one off in this order. And it will be, let's see if I get this right, it will be Lisa, Sierra, and then Michael will close us out. Okay, I guess I am up. Um, I was trying to debate between two poems, but I think, um, let's see. The choice Lisa. Um, okay. So I am going to read a poem uh, that finally got picked up after submitting it like everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, every, like I said, every poem has its time. So um, I'm gonna actually start out with a, what I call a musical epigraph. And um, we're gonna sing a little bit of our favorite um, Taurus Stevie Wonder. Sierra. So um, I'm just going to sing a few lines and then start into the poem. So this is just a few lines from Stevie Wonder's Knocks Me Off My Feet. I see us in a park strolling the summer days of imaginings in my head and words from my heart told only to the wind without ever being said. Declaration written on a leaf. I don't want to wait until my skin is a wrinkled leaf to have love housed in brick able to withstand a thousand rains. I hollow out all your secrets, line them inside ringing clocks where only I can hear your rusted shame. I know what it's like to fall into a poison pit. I won't wait until the fall for romance to bloom like summer leaves, green, bright, with veins rustling to keep alive and not hit brick walls. Yesterday, I heard you singing the saddest love song, rain soaked and low like a mouth left hollow of kisses for years. Notes fell off your tongue, your heartbreak ringing in my ear. You became a drifting leaf about to meet its demise under a brick. Darling, stop your wailing and trust my love. I know you've trusted some wicked ones who left you more hollow than winter branches, turned your heart into brick. With me, it's okay if you sometimes fall. I will kiss the stitches on your heart, never leave you hanging off a cliff, fingers pulsing, tingling. How can I stop telephones of the past from ringing? From you, I'll make sure love is in a busted safe of counterfeit bills, carry you like belief, cradles a ladybug. Let your spirit no longer hollow in the presence of love. Let it fall so fully into mine, not even a thunderbolt of bricks could shatter us. I carry your love in a, I carry your love in a brick case. You always bring me to higher wisdom where falling no longer hurts. I no longer fear rusted doorknobs to close rooms their threats now hollow. Every day with you, I'm alive as a budding leaf. I see us in a brick summer house. Nothing is rusted, no alarms ring. My body and spirit are never hollow with you falling into me like millions of blushing red leaves. Thank you.
think we said you're next, Sierra, if you want to unmute and go, or I can flip it over to Michael. Wait, is it I'm next? I thought Michael was next. Is he? Yeah, next? The, the chat and what we said were different. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I did, I get it, did I get it wrong? <laughs> uh, yeah. It happens. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> I'll go for it. Was going, it was going so well. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, this last piece is called Sunnyside. It was actually a prompt to uh, talk about mass incarceration. And um, oddly, all I could think about was the legalization of marijuana in places like Chicago and how so many people were incarcerated for that same thing. Um, and it's not finished. You'll see where I was going with this. The word sunny or sunny side just kept popping up. So you'll see my successful and sometimes failed attempts to <laughs> make it a, a threat throughout. Here we go. Welcome to Sunnyside, the marijuana dispensary in downtown Chicago. You can almost miss its front door, discreet brown brick. The street is blocked off for outdoor dining or festivals, lessens the traffic. This region is jovial. And Tume's juicy fruit blares from my headphones, just as it did from the windows of my childhood West Side apartment, where mama cooked her eggs sunny side up. Mama loved the yellow yolk on top of the eggs, the runniness. I prefer my eggs fried hard, anything to remove me from the hen. It was a sunny day in July when my mother came home dripped in sweat, wearing denim Daisy Dukes and a wife beater. She carried the switch blade in her hands and assertively said, I had to stab that motherfucker. She stabbed my sister's father for pampers. This was the beginning of police visiting the apartment, her running into traffic with the baby, me visiting her behind bars, me visiting her in mental institutions for 16 years now. They say the most violence happens in Chicago when it's hot. As a naive child, I lumped together all the West Side brown bodies that were intoxicated off street meds as criminal. There was no Sunnyside marijuana dispensary during my childhood. In my eyes, there were thieves, weed heads, crackheads, spiritually dark people. I was high off too many dare commercials. Until I woke up in full-blown conversations with myself, cursing in the shower, imagining a rumbling with an enemy each day, that moment brought me to the Sunnyside dispensary. Florida is often sunny. I hadn't been to Tampa in 10 years until recently left my father to the palm trees, believing men can always hunt. I am culpable for loving him, but not leading. The way he ate the ribs at our dinner outing like a starved child and dipped his fingers in for the firecracker shrimp. The way his pants could barely fit around his waist. The way his brain seemed to waver like a feather floating between trees. He craves more than sugar-coated marijuana. I can see why he sometimes committed crimes to be incarcerated, at least a guaranteed meal. Mass incarceration is too textbook a topic. To speak of it as my brother sits behind bars for activity that started off as a marijuana dispensary without the building and government seal of approval feels hypocritical. And I am only consumed with the idea that he missed three appointments to study the GED with me. I have Trayvon Martin, my own kin. It was a semi-sunny day in April when I first landed a job helping mainly mothers gain employment to improve generational poverty. Only the jobs paid minimum wage and many of the mothers had multiple children. Mass incarceration is not a conversation to gullibly empathize with black men over. Our black women are masculinized, made into hunters without guns to shoot the chicken because the chicken ain't clucking on Chicago streets. So we steal the meat, place it in backpacks and walk through detectors hoping to not get caught, but we're caught too often and our children starve in belly and are birth deprived. I am now at Sunnyside. I know that I got lost trying to get here. There are sweat beads on my forehead. My Apple iPhone says that I have walked three miles, misdirected trying to purchase berry gummy marijuana. I know that I am leaving Sunnyside with a beautiful orange and white bag as though I just purchased an expensive watch. I know my father was never afforded the tools to own a dispensary like this but he supplied and took in similar drugs. He has spent nearly every other year of his life incarcerated because of this. I grew up on the west side of Chicago and Sunnyside is not a description fit for the environment of cold brown brick. I now live by a lake 
and enjoy the sun beaming on me as I jog alongside others who seek to be healthy. I'm sure many of them partake in a few gummies at night shamelessly, yet some families never recover from governmentally approved stigmas. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to say thanks again to the Writers Guild for hosting us all. And thanks everybody for listening to our art and for being here tonight. Um, my last poem is about leaving earth. Uh, <laughs> I wrote it with some books in mind. Um, I've been writing a lot about space and one of my creative writing teachers in college, Dave Shoemate, he always said to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. And so um, I've been reading some books of poetry about space, and these are awesome. So Life on Mars by Tracy K. Smith. Um, also, The Tilt Torn Away from the Seasons. Um, it's by Elizabeth Lindsay Rogers. But uh, they've both been really, really cool, um, especially in conceptualizing this last poem for me, which, it, which is called Colonizing Mars. Yeah. So um, here it goes. Uh, those first few frail, fragile, faltering, fawn, baby steps into the unknown, trembling, intrepid, and treble-cleft, cloven-hoofed, doe-eyed, and spindly, though they may be. Maybe those first few steps will be the way for you, for me, eventually to encounter, to conquer our baby deer fear, our crazy sheer fear of running of falling, of failing. Maybe those first few steps will transform into rushing, into dark night, into dark, into. And when you take those first faltering baby steps, dear baby dear, recall how we all got here, how we all got here, how we all got to this desperate jump ship exigency, to this desolate necessity for earth exit strategy, how we broke her how we beer bottle drenched, pickpocketed, flamethrowered, and starved, baked potatoed her. How we burned up, smoked out, tear gas, broken glass, and exhausted her, exasperated, gasping only, gasping, only gasping, no more exhaling, only feminine fasting. Our mother earth, a guilt dirty rock of a home to rock it off of alone. We are victims and villains, wicked and hurt. And when you take those first fawn baby steps, dear, there will be a greedy, needy, hungry evolution, pushing our bodies slowly over time so that we eventually can cut our astronautical umbilical cord, so we eventually can cut off our oxygen dependence, so we eventually can switch it up, so we can suck it up, so we can move on to carbon or hydrogen or helium from some sun, some solar system, a sum of light years from here. But hey, as my fifth grade teacher in biology would say, live, migrate, or die. I wonder, where would we wonder? Which planet did we plan when we went there first in our minds? Mars, naturally. And I wonder who would be invited to go, who would be forced to stay, everyone feeling as though they were in the belly of the whale. And when you take those first frail steps, dear, the first year of your life will seem like a lifetime. But the longer you are alive, the faster it goes because time is relative and your life is a constellation, a group of relatives trying to tell the same story together, whether cosmology, the stories of how you and me came to be, or astronomy, the anatomy of a galaxy. So when you take those first few steps, dear me, it will be out of this world. <laughs> literally, figuratively, physically, emotionally, you are neither guilty nor guilt-free, dear little dear, during your new dawn, during this long yawn, when you stretch your little fawn legs past the atmosphere, how will you move forward? Trembling, spindly, sometimes rushing into the unknown, into the frontier, always growing, up, always tempted to look back. And that's that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. And also thanks to Lisa and thanks to Sierra for being our readers this evening. Let's, uh, let's now have a final piece from 
Akiko Pavolka, our uh, musician this evening, and then I'll come back with some parting words. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tony uh, for having me tonight. Uh, it's been great. I mean, uh, it's really inspire, inspire, inspiring to listen to everybody's poem, reading, writing. Um, it's great. And uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for Michael, Lisa, and Tiara. And it was great. And uh, um, I would like to play one short song and this is a uh, for you guys and for the audience and uh, for the rest of the night tonight it's called the uh, night talks Thank <laughs> you. 
Fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And Kiko Pavoka, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for being part of the show tonight. We're wonderful. Those were just great songs. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank also our three poets this evening, Michael Bauman, Lisa Kwong, and Sierra Miller for joining us from hither and yon. You guys are all over the place, and I'm glad you could all be here together with us this evening. Yes, yay for Lisa's stable internet connection. <laughs> Thanks for the internet gods for being stable for all of us tonight. Um, we did a, we did great. Everybody did great tonight. Hardly any uh, glitching or dropouts at all. So that's going to do it for our July edition of the Writers Guild Spoken Word Series. And we thank you all for joining us. Be sure and join us next month, Wednesday, August 4th, when we will have poets Hiromi Yoshida, J.L. Kato, Tonya Matthew with music by sax player Tony Malaby. Um, again, be sure and uh, run by our website, writersguildbloomington.com. Uh, or, you know, come find us on any, uh, whatever your favorite flavor of social media platform is. And uh, we'd, be, uh, we'd be glad to tell you more about what we're doing. Uh, once again, my name is Tony Brewer. And along with uh, Joan Hawkins and Kyle Quas behind the scenes, uh, we produce this series that's been virtual for over a year now. And we're very much looking forward to a time, I think, coming relatively, relatively soon in the future when we can all get together again in person. And uh, I am going to shut off the live stream and decouple from the matrix. But uh, you folks on um, you folks on Zoom, be sure to hang out because we'll unmute everybody and we'll get some real applause and we can chat for a bit. But uh, thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, have a pleasant evening. <laughs>